Uh, my name's Jonathan. I'm your resident astronomer here on the Viking Jupiter. And I'm here to share with you what I think is one of my favorite presentations, and I hope you enjoy it a lot, too. This is about adventures in weightlessness. So having promised you fun, the first thing I'm going to do is show you an equation. Okay. Oh, no, I, I can see people walking out already. All right, so this is, this is Newton's law of universal gravitation. And he basically, when he realized that there was, there was such a thing as gravity, he realized that this was a force between objects. And what this means here is that there's some sort of gravitational constant, g, and then it's the product of the two masses, so the mass of object one, object two, and then divided by the distance between them squared. So what this, what this equation says is that if there are only two things in the universe, or even more than that, both of them will attract each other, and uh, it's the, the force of the attraction is, is proportional to their masses, but then it's divided by the square of the distance. So in other words, the farther apart things are, the less attraction there is between them. But basically, that any two objects in the universe are going to attract each other through this force. And uh, this came into a practical, uh, uh, practical consideration for me. I used to weigh over 300 pounds, and uh, this was me on my second cruise. And I realized that I was not going to be able to change the universal gravitational constant or the mass of the Earth. And so if I wanted to uh, lessen the attraction between me and the Earth, I was going to have to lessen my own mass. And so that's what I ended up doing. I ended up losing half of, uh, uh, half of what I weighed. So I'm literally half the man I used to be. Thank you. Uh, the struggle is when you're on the, the Jupiter for two months trying to keep that like that. But uh, anyway, that's, so, so you know, the weight of the object is, is going to be proportional to or the weight is going to affect the attraction between there. But basically, as, as Galileo showed, if you drop two objects of, an equal, of unequal weights, they'll both fall at the same amount of time. So we'll talk a little bit about what, is, what are the implications of this for what we would call weightlessness, or more properly, microgravity rather than zero gravity. So what is the force of gravity? How do we experience that? And we'll start with uh, looking at, at uh, Sir Stephen Hawking here is sitting in his, in his chair. Uh, if, if we think about the force of gravity, there's a force that's pulling him down towards the Earth. The, the weight of the Earth, um, because the mass is so much greater, is attracting him and, and pulling him down. He's actually pulling up slightly on the Earth as well, but the primary force is, is pulling him down towards the Earth. The thing is, is, when you are, is that you can't feel the force of gravity. You actually don't feel that in your, in your body at all. What you're actually feeling is what they call the normal force. And this is the force to, with which uh, an object, something is pushing up against you. So I'm feeling what I feel is like my weight on the stage. Actually, I'm feeling the, the stage pushing up on me. If I was sitting down, I'd feel the chair pushing up on me. Your scale, when you stand on your scale, that's measuring basically is how much the scale is pushing up against your body. So you've got this normal force and you've got the gravitational force and they are you know, equal when you're, when you're in a, uh, a state like this. So if, if you take away that normal force, if you take away that force of what's pushing back against you, you have just the force of gravity pulling you down. And in this case here, Stephen Hawking floating in a zero-g environment. He's got nothing pushing him down, and so he's able to free float. And again, you don't feel that force of gravity when you're, uh, when you're in this kind of condition. So when we talk about uh, microgravity or zero gravity, we're talking about a situation where there's nothing pushing back up against you, like, like uh, in this situation here. So just to, again, to put a little bit of physics into this, if, if I were to uh, drop an object here on the stage, it would fall at, uh, you know, using the Earth's gravitational constant, which is 32 feet per second per second, or 10 meters per second per second. What that means is when I drop something, it'll fall 10 meters in the first second. The second second, it will accelerate by an, ex an extra 10 meters per second, so it will fall an extra 20 meters and then third, it will fall an extra 30 meters on top of that. So by the time it hit three seconds, it's now fallen 60, 60 meters. So falling is, is illustrated for you in, in A. In B, what happens here is if I were to throw an object across the room, assuming there's no air resistance, if I were to throw a piece of paper across the room and drop one at the same time, that piece of paper would land at the same time as the one that I dropped. It would just travel farther across because we've got this now sideways uh, velocity going with it. So this is what's shown in B here. The object in B is falling just as fast as the object in, in A, except now it's just going out horizontally. 
And what would happen if you fired it fast enough, you could, you could have this situation of a C where it wouldn't fall at all. And uh, you know, we don't really experience that when you have a, a, a situation with gravity. Uh, by the way, this was, uh, I was realizing that the fastest way to get a Tesla to accelerate to, uh, to 60 miles an hour or even faster, if you drop a Tesla off a 50-story a building, it'll be going 110 miles an hour in the five seconds that it takes to hit the ground. So that's the fastest way to accelerate a Tesla, by the way. Um, again, assuming no air resistance. But what happens, so what's the practical implication of this, is, is when we have a satellite that's in orbit, it's still falling towards the Earth. The, the force of gravity in outer space is slightly less than it is here. Uh, at, at the height of the International Space Station, the force of gravity is about 89% of what it is on the surface of the Earth. But what happens is, so you're still falling towards the Earth, but now you're going forward at 17,500 miles an hour. And what happens is that you, as you fall towards the Earth, the Earth's surface is curving away from you. And so you're always continuously falling. And so this is where the term free fall comes into play here. You're actually just continuously falling around the Earth the whole time. So gravity is still pulling you towards the Earth, but you're going fast enough that the surface of the Earth pulls away and the Earth just keeps curving away from underneath of you. So that's what free fall is. When we, when we talk about microgravity or whatever, it's the experience that you get in, in B here. And what happens is that if you're inside an object that's traveling like B is, you're just going to float. If you're assuming that you're accelerating at the same rate that that was accelerated at, you would just float in the inside of that and not feel any force of gravity because you're both falling towards the Earth at the same speed. So people ask, you know, what does it feel like to be weightless? Is it the same as jumping out of an airplane? And so uh, I just wanted to share this illustration. This is my son here. Um, he. Uh, when he turned uh, in his birthday about seven years ago, I asked his wife what he wanted for his birthday, and he said, well, he really wants to go skydiving again. And um, so there he goes, uh, falling away. What she added, he really wants to go skydiving again. And then she said, would you go with him? And so, so this is me. Uh, he, went, he went by himself. I'm strapped to a guy here named Punisher. That's, that's his real name. This guy has like over 10,000 jumps behind him. Uh, this was my first time and probably the last time at, at, uh, skydiving out of an airplane. But so what happens is you have that initial uh, fall, and it it, the feeling of falling lasted less than a second is all I can say. But then you, you hit what, what, what you call terminal velocity, where the air is pushing up against you so fast that you don't accelerate anymore like you would. Uh, basically what happens here is you hit about 100 miles an hour and uh, when you're spread out like this. You're not, you're, you're not falling any faster than 100 miles an hour. As you can see from my cheeks here, it's like sticking your head out a window on a moving car. You've just got the force of air blowing against you a lot, and so the air is pushing against you, and so you really don't feel weightless. You feel like you're standing outside in a hurricane uh, with that much air pressure against you. It was, a, it was a very cool experience, but this is not what being weightless feels like. So in order to, to get that sense of microgravity, you have to take the air resistance out of the equation. And the way you can do that, as I mentioned, if you're inside an object that's following a, a, what we would call a ballistic trajectory, which is the trajectory that something follows if, you, uh, if it's subject to the, to the gravity. And so you can do this in an airplane by uh, accelerating up to a certain point and then cutting the engines and letting it follow kind of a coasting path, like if I were to throw a, a piece of paper up in the air, it's going to coast and then come back down again. If you were inside that piece of paper, you would, you would feel uh, no, no force of gravity. And so the, the plane can do this for a short period of time, like 15 to 20 seconds. It can follow this, this trajectory. And the problem is you reach the point where you, you can't accelerate the plane fast enough to keep following that 32 feet per second per second. So in the course of like about 20 to 25 seconds here, you've got actually zero G. But then what happens is the plane has to pull out of that and come back up again. And so you, you're actually now in this, uh, in this low spot coming out of it. You're going at almost two Gs. You're feeling twice the force of gravity. So I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. But you can simulate this even in a small airplane. You don't need to, to have a fancy airplane to do this. Um, here's some guys in a private plane. <laughs> I assure you no animals were harmed in the, uh, in the process of making this video. But you can see just a very short period of time there the dog was, was floating around like that. So you can do that in a small plane. You, can, you kind of feel that away in a, in a way, a little bit like that when you go over a hill in a car. 
and it feels like your stomach's dropping away from you. So again, I talk about, you know, if you've got things that are traveling at the same speed, if you've got astronauts traveling inside the space shuttle, that's all fine, you're floating around inside there, but what happens if the space shuttle were to accelerate suddenly? Now you've got a little bit of a different situation, and so here's, you're going to see the thrusters of the space shuttle firing. This is to change its orbit slightly. Here's the astronauts inside, and then when the, when the engines fire, you see they get pushed to the back here. So uh, that's you know, every once in a while during, during a, a space mission when they change the trajectory like that, you know, the astronauts have to brace themselves and be ready for that kind of thing to happen. So you know, there's a lot of reasons for doing this kind of work in outer space. One of them is that you, know, you can grow things like protein crystals you can grow in outer space in, in a microgravity environment that you can't grow on Earth. These complex crystals would actually collapse under their own weight on Earth, but in, in the International Space Station or in a laboratory that's up there for a long time, you can grow these complex proteins into crystal form and then bring them back for use on Earth. But, uh, you know, as I was talking about the early days of the space program and the unknowns that we faced, one of them was how would people react to being in zero gravity? We didn't know what the effect on the human body would be. And so when we launched uh, Alan Shepard and, and John Glenn, for example, here's John Glenn raising his visor and uh, he's going to have a little bit of food here, which is basically like in a toothpaste tube, and then closing his visor real fast. We didn't know if people could swallow when they were going through this kind of thing. We, we could simulate it briefly, but we didn't know if people would actually be able to swallow liquids or swallow whole foods and things like that. And so um, this was, you know, it was, a, it was a serious test at that time just to see how astronauts were going to react to being in, uh, in microgravity for short periods of time. And now, of course, uh, eating has become a lot more uh, fun on space missions. Uh, they have a lot more variety of types of things. Here's uh, I was talking to astronauts who, who do this. They say, you know, this is the most fun thing that astronauts get to do on a space mission is, is playing with their food. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, this is the kind of thing that always uh, makes the... Uh, the, the videos coming back to, to Earth, we don't get to see the type of work that they're doing. Here, for example, this is uh, surface tension of the milk is holding that on to this um, strawberry shortcake thing here. So if things behave differently. Uh, again, surface tension holding that on there. You, could, you can uh, draw a glob, here's a glob of water that's just being held together by surface tension. And uh, you know, trying, here, for example, putting uh, an Alka-Seltzer tablet in that and seeing what happens. But you know, it, it's it's just really interesting to see how things behave like that, and it's um, uh, you know talking to the astronauts to do that. They say this is this is fun for them to do. They don't spend their whole time doing this, but it's a great way after they've been working a 16-hour day to kind of relax and enjoy it. And uh, you know, th this is again, this is this is not astronauts wake, wasting time playing with food in space. This is how they actually enjoy their food like that. Uh, there are other, other fun things that you can do in microgravity environment. This is one from Skylab. Alan, Alan Bean doing push-ups, and now with Jack Lausma on top. And now with Owen, Owen Garriott joining him. So again, making it look like he's, he's putting effort into this. Actually, he's... <laughs> That was one of the great things about Skylab is they had all this room because it was the inside of a booster. There was a 22-foot diameter interior here that these guys could uh, do all kinds of experiments with in, uh, in microgravity and, and try things out. Just it looks like uh, a tremendous uh, amount of, uh, of enjoyment to be able to do that. They, they, one of the concerns with, with um, this type of thing was if an astronaut got stuck in the middle, would they, would they be able to get out? And they actually did this experiment on the International Space Station. They had several astronauts steady one guy in position in the middle of a module and then watch him try to get to the other side. He was you know, making swimming motions and doing all kinds of things, and eventually, after about a minute, was able to get enough air resistance to make himself move across to, to be able to touch the wall. So that's a, that's a real concern. If you're accelerating that fast and you don't have any velocity relative to the, to the thing, you, you are just going to float there until either the air pushes you, uh, the fans push you over to the side or whatever. So this is what it's like to work on the inside of a spacecraft during, uh, during microgravity. But when, as I mentioned this morning, one of the things you have to learn to do is to be able to work outside 
in microgravity. And so Alexei Leonov was the first one to go outside the spaceship and, uh, and try this out. He was outside for about 11 minutes. He's only attached by a tether and an oxygen cable uh, cord to the, uh, to the spacecraft. And he basically just kind of floated around without much control other than just being able to pull himself along and then he would bounce off of things. He didn't really demonstrate being able to do any, any real work out there, but he showed that, again, that people could be outside a spacecraft and, and maneuver around. And so the U.S. was, was also planning to do its own uh, spacewalk. They wanted to have a little bit more control over that, so they came up with this gun that had two, uh, two jets on it, a nitrogen-powered, uh, I believe it was nitrogen-powered, that the astronaut could point around and maneuver himself. And so this was, this was the test that they tried it out on, on Earth. The guy's basically on like an air hockey table, and you could only really try it out in, in two dimensions at a time. You couldn't simulate the up and down movement, so they, first they were trying him. Uh, he's holding the gun out in front of him here, moving himself across, and now he's uh, on his back. Uh, suspended to, to simulate zero gravity. So we got kind of the feeling that the astronaut would be able to control some things with this gun. And uh, you know, here, here again, another test of it, being able to move themselves across very slowly. So they tried this out on, on Gemini 4 in June of 1965. And here's Ed White. This is speeded up, by the way, by a factor. I think this was six frames per second, so it's, it's uh, faster than it actually happened. But so he, he was able to float outside, and he had about a 20-some foot t tether here. Got outside, he was able to, to use the gun to kind of control himself a little bit. It only, uh, the gas in the gun only lasted a few minutes, and then eventually he was just, uh, just like Lanoff, was uh, uh, confined to being able to, to maneuver by pulling himself along. But he said it was great, it was great fun, and he said uh, coming back into the capsule was the saddest moment he ever had in his life. So we, we started to get actually really confident that we could work in outer space. And so our, our plans in Gemini got to be much more aggressive in terms of thinking about the types of things that we might be able to do, uh, doing assembly of structures or being able to, to tether two spacecraft together. And so they practiced in, uh, you know, I talked about the airplane that could go up and down. The astronauts nicknamed that the Vomit Comet because they would do these uh, flights, and you would have 80, 80 of these parabolas where you'd go between 0G and then 2G and then 0G and 2G. And after 80 of those, pretty much everybody got sick. But it was an opportunity to try things out, and so here's uh, uh, Dick Gordon who's going to be trying out a an assembly process. The, the, the problem he, he told me, he said, was that, that the 0G uh, airplane gave you um, a false sense of security because what happened was every 15 seconds, you know, you practice getting out of the, out of the spacecraft. Every, after every 15 seconds, suddenly gravity is pulling you back down. You get to reset your position and then start again for the next 15 seconds of weightlessness. And what happened is you got, when the guy's like, here's uh, Gordon outside trying to work on this thing, he's having to hold himself steady with one hand and tie this tether with the other hand. He said really was, it was like trying to tie your shoes with one hand working out there. And uh, astronaut Gene Cernan on Gemini 9 actually got into very dangerous physical trouble from overexertion from trying to control himself. His, his goal was to go to the back of the Gemini spacecraft and put on this uh, rocket pack and then try to fly himself around. And he was never, he, he got himself to the back of the spacecraft, but he had overexerted so much that his face, face plate had completely fogged over. And when he landed, they called him back in basically because his heart rate was racing like crazy. And uh, when he landed, he had seven pounds of sweat in his suit that had, uh, from the exertion of trying to do that. So we were really concerned that maybe working outside the spacecraft was not going to be feasible after all. But it was up to Buzz Aldrin and a couple other people who came up with the idea of training in another type of environment, which was training underwater. And that if we could train in a pool like this, this would simulate the feel of microgravity and uh, you know, give you the opportunity to, to practice maneuvering around, and they also came up with the idea of putting handholds and footholds on the spacecraft to give you some way to steady yourself when you're outside. So this idea that was tried for Gemini 12 was a great success. Buzz Aldrin had the only really successful spacewalks of the Gemini program as a result of that. But, and NASA has taken this and taken it to the next level, and this is their, uh, their uh, what they call the wet F, which is the, uh, the, un under, uh, the weightless uh, underwater training facility, this uh, Sonny Carter training facility in, in uh, Houston at the jo Johnson Space Center. 
they've got the entire, basically the entire ISS, the entire International Space Station in this pool. So this thing is, is almost as long as a football field. And astronauts will get in here and actually practice uh, their um, spacewalks. This, uh, my wife and I had the opportunity to go and visit this with, uh, with our friend Mike Leinbach, uh, who was the launch director for uh, the space shuttle program, and, and visit this facility. I w it would have been great to be able to get down in there, but here you can see this, the, uh, the space station modules sunk in this 40-foot deep pool. And uh, the astronauts, you know, wear their normal types of spacesuits. An astronaut had just finished his practice run here. And uh, I think, luckily, he had come out of here before they took the arms off of it. But, uh, but this is, so this is what it looks like working underwater. You've got, you've got divers who are helping you out, but you've got a neutrally buoyant spacesuit, so you're able to practice what it's like working outside in zero gravity. The one problem with this is that you are not weightless inside the suit. You're still being pulled down by the force of gravity. So uh, the suit weighs several hundred pounds, and it's got lots of rigid parts, you know, a steel things which are not a problem in outer space, but when you're upside down in Earth's gravity, your, your body is pressing against these very hard interior parts of the, of the uh, suit. And one of the things that, that most people don't know is, uh, several astronauts have told me this, is that just about every person who trained for doing uh, extra, ve extra vehicular activity or taking a spacewalk, just about every person who trained for that has required so shoulder surgery after the mission because of the uh, intensity of the training and the, and the damage that you can get from doing this kind of work. So they really work hard when they're out there doing these things where it looks like they're floating around. They've put a lot of training into it and are, are really um, sacrificing their bodies for doing that. Having said that, I do want to say that you don't have to have a spacesuit to, uh, to experience zero gravity, as uh, Kate Upton demonstrated. I, I, I can tell you from experience, she was very cold, I would imagine, in this, in this. I did not wear a bikini on this airplane, but it was very cold in that airplane. Anyway, let me tell you a little bit about what it's actually like, what I felt when I got a chance to do this kind of flight. So this is a, a Go Zero G company. Again, as I mentioned, they do these up and downs, and so, what happens is they, um, they, they give you the opportunity to experience 15 of these parabolas, which they said is about the number that most people can handle without getting sick. And I was determined to put that to the test. Uh, they, they, in this case, we flew out of Orlando. We went out over the Gulf of Mexico, and they had a 100-mile-long corridor that was set aside for them, and you had to be able to go at, at the high point, when you're going uh, at, at, at weightlessness, you're 36,000 feet up, and then it goes down to 24,000 feet and back up and down. So you're going up and down 12,000 feet over the course of 100 miles, then you turn around and come back the other direction. That's, that was the flight plan. This was over the course of about an hour and a half once you get out to that, to that facility or that place. So this is, uh, this is us getting ready to go on this flight, and uh, normally they can take up to 36 people. In this case, they... Uh, had reserved the front of the airplane. They divide the airplane into three zones, you, uh, and you wear socks according to which zone you're supposed to be in. You've got a gold zone, a blue zone, and a, and a silver zone. Uh, at the people at the very front of the airplane, they, were, they had set it aside. Uh, they were uh, trying out a test for a, a, a pilot for a, 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 a TV uh, game show in zero gravity, which I've never seen that they actually made that, but that would be a really interesting thing to see how you would do a zero gravity game show. But anyway, so it, it looks like a standard 727 uh, airliner, and it is pretty much stock airliner. The, the difference is when you get inside, there's just uh, there's 36 seats at the very back of the airplane, and you can see you've got all this uh, space towards the front, which is all padded, thank, good, thank goodness, and I'll tell you why a little later on. Uh, the only two modifications they make to this is that they, uh, the oil pump system is modified to make sure that the engines keep getting oil when they're doing the zero gravity thing. And the other thing is they took out the toilet. Uh, you do not, uh, chemical toilets do not like zero gravity. Uh, and I'll let you imagine why that would be the case. So anyway, this, that was the only two modifications made to the airplane. And they said actually that it's less stress on the airplane doing these kind of parabolas than it is just making a regular landing. So we, we went through a, uh, about a two hour orientation on the ground and they told us what to expect. And about an hour before the flight, they gave us um, anti-nausea medication if we wanted to take it, which I absolutely took. Uh, I have a ten I, I, you know, I, I've, it's funny, I've never gotten seasick, but I've gotten close in cars and things like that, and I just thought it might be a good idea to be prepared for that. Uh, a friend of mine took uh, 
took some uh, ginger tablets and offered me one, and what ended up was tasting ginger the whole time. But uh, anyway, so we went up on this, this flight. Uh, we were prepared for this. They told us what we would have to do is lie down on the ground. When we got to the point where we were going to start these parabolas, you lie down on the floor, and then they'll give you a warning that you're about to go into zero G. And when you get to the end of your 15 seconds, they make this call, feet down, coming out, feet down, coming out. And the idea is that you want to make sure you're not up on the ceiling when suddenly two, twice the force of gravity comes out because you're going to make a pretty hard fall. So let me show you what this looks like. We, we did, first of all, they did a Mars simulated gravity. So this would be like one third of the Earth's gravity. And uh, this is, they have GoPro cameras stationed around there so you get this nice souvenir video. So this is me in the middle here trying a Mars push up. And I, obviously, I can, you know, can barely do push ups here on Earth, so I wasn't quite sure what I needed to do. Then the, uh, the instructor luckily came over and showed me the right way to do a Mars push up. So that was, that was fun to actually be able to do it like that. So that's one third gravity, and now suddenly uh, the parabola is over. Time for us to lie down. And so now you have two minutes of about twice, twice normal gravity. Uh, and the next thing we did was to do two uh, moon simulated gravities. So this one, this is at one sixth G, so you weigh one sixth of what you would do on Earth. And this is the view from the front. They told us not to jump. And of course, the first thing I did was jump and hit my head on the ceiling, and I cracked a tooth. Um, I mean, it, it, you know, the, the temptation, of course, is, is just to feel you know, this wonderful feeling of being able to jump so high. And again, it, just seemed, it seems like it lasts all too short a time, and it does feel like you know, the 15 seconds goes by pretty fast. But it, w what was really unusual in the feeling of this was that your center of gravity is totally different than what you're used to on Earth. Um, when we walk on Earth, what we do is we put our, our center of gravity forward and, and it kind of pulls us forward as we walk. And so when your center of gravity is now, it, when your gravity is, is only one-sixth what it is, suddenly that kind of feeling doesn't quite work anymore. And so it takes a little getting used to figuring out exactly how to walk. And so uh, the Apollo astronauts on the moon figured out a couple of different ways uh, to walk. Some of them used what they called the bunny hop. Other guys used was kind of like a ski, uh, a cross-country skiing motion to move along the ground here. So not only do, are they weighing one-sixth what they normally do, but then they've got these uh, backpacks, which would weigh a couple hundred pounds on Earth. They only weigh, uh, you know, like 50 or 60 pounds up there. But again, that's going to throw your center of gravity off. But they did pretty well. But of course, then sometimes what would happen is you start going fast enough, you just, you just lose control of where you're going. And uh, there was a lot of this later on in the... Uh, in the program. Fourth graders love this video, by the way. But then you can you just get on your knees and push yourself right back up again. Boy, I wish I could do that these days. But uh, yeah, it just, it just looks like a tremendous amount of fun to do that and, and a fast way to, to move around. I, it was funny, uh, again, thinking about things we take for granted here. I saw a video of, of trying an experiment on this zero-g plane to see how fast somebody could run on a treadmill in moon environment. Could, could you run as fast on a treadmill on the moon as you could on Earth? And that was an interesting experiment. And it actually turned out you could almost run, almost run as fast. If you ran too fast, it started, again, you lost your, your sense of balance and uh, uh, you know, it, just, it just didn't work, but you could run almost as fast uh, at one sixth gravity as you could on Earth. I didn't try that though. So this was another, uh, another one sixth G uh, attempt here. Again, trying to help each other up. I got a little bit more stable here. You know, the trainer's like, hey, there's the camera. Look at the camera. Show everybody you're having a good time. It was funny. I mentioned having cracked this tooth. Uh, the same tooth ended up cracking uh, before I came on the cruise here. And I, and I was uh, asking my dentist, I said, I think I broke a tooth. And, and she said, which one is it? And I, and I told her, and she said, oh, yeah, that's the one you broke doing zero G. And I was like, oh, that's great that your dentist remembers something like that. <laughs> so anyway, don't jump in, in a small, confined area when you're doing that. So we had the two parabolas of, of moon gravity, one of Mars, and now it was time to try an actual zero G. And so this one is, is now zero G. So suddenly you're, you're, you know, 
you're just not confined to the ground anymore. And they say, don't kick. And of course, the first thing you try to do is kick, because that's what would you do if you were swimming. And that's why they make you take your shoes off, so you don't kick somebody. Again, uh, time went by very fast. I'll point out for you, they also have ropes along uh, near the ceiling there, so you can, you can, like, you can see along the, or, or along the edge there, so that if, if you uh, want to try to pull yourself along, you can do that. So that was the first, the first parabola. Felt really great. Uh, you can tell the instructor's got something in mind for me here on the second one. So <laughs> he spun me around, and I immediately lost all sense of orientation. I had no idea where I was. And so here I was upside down, and then they started calling feet down coming out, and I thought I was on the ceiling. And you see me struggling. <laughs> I'm trying to get down off the ceiling, and it turned out I was on the floor all along. I had no idea where I was in that, and it was just the most bizarre feeling in the world, just in the course of 10 seconds, to have completely lost my sense of orientation like that. And there were some people who were doing loops all the time. I didn't find doing the spin was disorienting, I mean, to my inner ear. It didn't make me feel nauseous or anything like that doing that. It was, just, it was such a strange sen sensation just to see things spinning around like that. Um, I made the big mistake, and so that was probably the best one of the, of the 12 or so parabolas. I made the mistake of trying to pull my camera out and then videotape with that, and that's the big no-no for me. If I try to read in a moving car, I'm gone. So I'm like staring at my phone, and then suddenly I realize I'm not feeling all that well. And uh, I came as, as close as you can get to throwing up without actually throwing up, but I did manage to make it through the whole flight. I, I realized from going back and looking at the pictures later on, there was a guy who was strapped down in the back of the airplane. I think he really didn't, uh, didn't adapt well to, to weightlessness. But they, uh, they did a number of things. They wanted us to try to do this Superman fly out, and of course, it would just turn into a giant cluster of uh, people colliding with each other. <laughs> there she is pulling herself along. There were some young folks on here that were just having a ball. They were having so much fun. And uh, there was a guy from Italy, uh, this guy with his phone there, and, and on the left is, is from Italy, and he was uh, writing this for a travel log, that, uh, a travel agency that he runs. And there was somebody on here who had won this as a prize, for, uh, as, as a raffle drawing. So it was fun to do that. Um, this was another, towards the end here, they had... Uh, this was around Christmas time, so they had us like throwing uh, snowflakes around and snowballs and things like that. And then uh, throwing what I thought were M&Ms, and I was disappointed to find out they were Skittles. But uh, <laughs> it's okay. But uh, yeah, so, so we're throwing Skittles around. Um, here's again one of the, some of the young folks having a great time. I was kind of just hanging out on the, on the wire there by the end here. But it was uh, you know, just a super experience. I'm really glad I got a chance to do it. Uh, you might have noticed that in the picture at the very beginning, I had my name tag was upside down, and that's how they identify you as a rookie, is that your name tag is upside down. And after you land successfully, they, they put your name tag on right side up. So that if I ever get the chance to fly and do that again, you know, I can, I can do that and, uh, and rightfully claim my, my space. So, uh, you know, this is not an endorsement for this company. Uh, I'm not sure, this is, this is one that I know does these flights in the U.S., it's called Go Zero G. There are ones in Europe, there's one in Russia that does this, and so if you're really interested in trying it out, and you don't want to pay a quarter of a million dollars or $400,000 to go up on, uh, on uh, uh, Jeff Bezos's or, or William Branson's um, uh, plane, you can try this yourself. The cost of this is, I think it's around $10,000 now, it's gone up a lot in the five years since I went on it. But uh, they even have frequent flyer discounts if you want to go and do that kind of thing. But it's an interesting experience. If you ever want to say you've done it, um, I would certainly uh, encourage you to, to try it out as, as something that's relative. I, you know, I felt it was relatively safe. I, I thought if, even if I got sick, that at least I tried it. And I'm, you know, I'm willing to try just about anything once. And uh, it, it was just, just a wonderful thing. It, of course, gives you credit as an astronomer to be able to talk about having done something like this as well. But then there, you know, there were people who were actually doing this for, for serious research purposes as well. The astronauts rent this out and try it out for uh, getting acclimated to space. It was, it was interesting. I asked one of the space shuttle astronauts, I said, how many of these flights do you do you know, to do things like uh, training to put your spacesuit back on again when you're going to come back home after the end of a space shuttle mission? And the guy said, we do maybe one of these flights 
uh, he, he said, if you're just going to be a mission specialist, somebody who's using the robot arm or doing an experiment, you do one of these flights to get a feeling what it's like to be in outer space. But he said, in terms of putting your suit on, he said, you will have been up in, in outer space for 10 to 14 days. You already know how to operate when it's time to put your, your, your suit back on. You've learned that within the first day or two of being up there. So they don't really need to do this for practice anymore. It's just the people who are going to be working outside the ship that then practice in the uh, underwater facility. And I do want to say one of the other things, too, is that um, you cannot predict who's going to get space sick or who's going to get what they call space adaptation syndrome. Uh, people who, who do absolutely well in fighter jets, uh, again, working with Eileen Collins, who was the first woman to command a space mission, um, she said she was absolutely fine in flying her T-38s and doing all kinds of aileron rolls and things like that. When she was horribly sick the first couple of days, she was up in, in outer space uh, to the point where it was debilitating, and she had to ask to, to be given a shot to, um, to help her uh, you know, be able to function. Uh, the, the great story is that uh, Senator Jake Garn, who was a, an avid pilot, w went up on one of the early space shuttle missions as a, as a, uh, as a mission or a, a payload specialist, and he got so violently ill that he was completely incapacitated the entire mission. And uh, now the astronauts jokingly refer to one Garn as being the maximum amount of sickness that anybody can feel from from weightlessness. And so they even named the uh, the training facility in Houston. It's named the Jake Garn Training Training Facility. So uh, I, I hope he's he's had uh, a good humor about that kind of thing. But it was uh, again, you just don't know when that's going to happen. Usually, after you've had one flight, you're fine for subsequent flights. But uh, it's it's something that that you have to be prepared for. And in the early missions, we didn't realize this was going to happen. It was only when astronauts be able, were able to start floating around inside the cabin, like in the Apollo missions, that we realized that this was going to be a problem. And at first, several astronauts were grounded from flying future missions because we thought there was something wrong with them, that they were getting space sickness. But we realize now that it affects just about half of, of astronauts that go up on their first mission. So that's a little bit about what it's like to, to be in, uh, in a microgravity environment. And I wanted to, make, uh, to end this with something that's really fun. And this was with a, a band called OK Go. And they did this amazing video called Inside Out and Upside Down. And what they did, this is, this is entirely filmed in zero G. There's no green screen. There's no cutting. This is all done in one take. And uh, what they, the one thing they did do is play with time in this. They filmed it over the course of seven parabolas. But what they do is they, uh, they speed up. The part where they're weightless is slightly speeded up to match the lyrics. And then the part where they're, where they're feet down for the two minutes, they, uh, that, that has been speeded up a lot. And then they're mouthing the words at like one quarter speed or something like that. So it looks seamless. It looks like they're singing it straight through. And, um, so I would encourage you when you take a look at this to see if you can tell when they're in zero gravity and when they're in twice gravity. And there's a great uh, video uh, on YouTube, the making of this video. And uh, they, they basically, they tried it out for a couple of times just to see what the concept would be like, that they took it back to uh, California, uh, experimented with different ideas, choreographed it, took it back, and then spent a week riding the Russian equivalent of the Vomit Comet. They would go up twice a day and practice, practice this uh, several times in each flight, getting sick each time. And then it was only in the very last take of the very last day that they actually got it all, all right here. So you'll see the reaction of the leader of the band when, uh, when this video finishes up here. But it's just, uh, to me, this is the epitome of having a great time in, in weightlessness. It's a great combination of... Uh, of art and music, and then what you can what you can do having fun in a completely novel environment. So I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. So 
I tell you what, I'd like to see the Viking Jupiter uh, vocalists be able to try that. That would be fun to see some talented people who know what they're doing be able to do that instead of breaking teeth in zero gravity. So uh, I think this, this may be my last lecture for you on this, uh, this cruise, and I just, again, wanted to thank you all so much for your support along the way. It's been wonderful being able to show you the stars up on deck, and uh, what a great opportunity it is to be able to share such an exciting time with you all, and uh, thank you all for your good humor and your patience throughout everything that's happened here over the last couple of weeks. Have safe travels home.